I've read that there were several times in your investing career when you were confident enough in one idea to put a lot of your money into it, say 25% or more. Uh, I believe a couple of those cases were American Express and the Washington Post in the 70s, and I've heard you discuss your thinking on those. But could you talk about any of the other times you've been confident enough to make such a big investment and what your thinking was in those cases? Charlie and I have been confident enough, if we were only running our own net worth, I'm certain a, a very significant number of times, if you go over 50 years, there have been a lot of times when you'd have put at least 75% of your net worth into an idea, wouldn't, aren't there, Charlie? Well, but 75% of your worth outside Berkshire has never been a very significant no. amount. Well, but I'm going back. Let's just assume it was. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let, let's just assume you didn't have Berkshire in the picture. There, there have been times, I mean, we've seen all kinds of ideas we would have put 75% of our net worth in. Warren, there have been times in my life when I've had more than 100% of my net worth invested well, in things. That's because you had a friendly banker, and I didn't. No, that, there have been times, well, initially I had 70, I had several times I had 75% of my net worth in one situation. There, there are situations you will see, they, over a long period of time, I mean, you, you, will, you will see things that it would be a mistake if you're working with smaller sums. It would be a mistake not to have half your net worth in. I mean, there, there you really do sometimes in security see things that are lead pipe cinches. And, and uh, you're not going to see them often, and they're not going to be talking about them on television or anything of the sort. But there, there will be some extraordinary things happen in a lifetime where you can put 75% uh, of your net worth or something like that in a given situation. There are stocks. I mean, there, actually, there's quite a few people in this room that have close to 100% of their net worth in Berkshire, and some of them had it for 40 or more years. Uh, Berkshire was not in the cinch category. It was in the strong probability category, I think. But, but I saw things in 2002 uh, in the junk bond field. I saw things in the equity markets. If you could have bought Cap Cities with Tom Murphy running it, uh, in the early, in 1974, it was selling at a third or a fourth what the properties were worth, and you had the best manager in the world running the place, and you had a business that was pretty damn good, even if, if, if the manager wasn't. Uh, you, you could have put, you could have put 100% of your net worth in there and not worried. You could have put 100% of your net worth in Coca-Cola uh, earlier than when we bought it, but certainly around the time we bought it, and that would not have been a dangerous position be far more dangerous to do a whole bunch of other things that brokers were recommending to people. Charlie, you want to come Yeah, up? if you, the students of America go to these elite business schools and law schools and they learn corporate finance the way it's now taught and investment management is the way it's now, now taught. And some of these people write articles in the newspaper and other places and they say, well, the whole secret of investment is diversification. That's the mantra. They've got it exactly back asward. The whole secret of investment is to find places where it's safe and wise to non-diversify. It's just that simple. Diversification is for the know-nothing investor. It's yeah, not you, for the professional. And there's nothing wrong with the know-nothing investor practicing it. It's exactly what they should practice. It's exactly what a good professional investors should not practice. But that's, you know, there's no contradiction in that. that uh, a know-nothing investor will get decent results as long as they know they're a know-nothing investor, diversify as to time they purchase their equities and as to the equities they purchase. That's crazy for somebody that really knows what they're doing. And uh, you will find opportunities that if you put 20% of your net worth in it, you have wasted the opportunity of a lifetime, you know, in terms of not really loading up, and uh, um, we've had the chance to do that way, way in our past when we were working with small sums of money. We'll never get a chance to do that working with the kinds of money that Berkshire does. We try to load up on things, uh, uh, and there will be markets when we get a chance to from time to time, but very seldom do we get to buy as much of any good idea as we would like to.
In the past, you've said, um, for an investor, you should simply, for 99% of investors, you should simply stick money in an index fund and let it go and don't worry about it. Um, those 1% of investors choose your best five stocks and put a substantial amount of money in it. I'm just wondering, how about a strategy of perhaps buying 20 of the best stocks in America, you know, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, Johnson Johnson, whatever, the companies that have been around for centuries or a century or decades or whatever, and just leaving it at that. Do you think, think that would outperform an index fund over the long term? And I want Charlie's opinion as well. Well, it's a little bit of, of I don't know whether you're saying the 20 largest companies, the 20 best, might, you might get different thoughts from different people on what they are. But I think you would, probably the 20 you would pick would virtually match the results of an index fund. Who knows exactly which ones would be the best. But the real distinction, and Graham made this in his book, basically, is between the person who is going to spend an appreciable amount of time becoming <clears throat> something of an expert on businesses, because that's what stocks are, or the person who is going to be busy with another profession wants to own equities and, and actually will do very well in equities. But the real problem they have is that they may tend to get excited about stocks at the wrong time. Uh, you know, they, they uh, if really, the idea of buying an index fund o over time is not to buy stocks at the right time or the right stocks, it's to avoid buying them at the wrong time, the wrong stocks. So if equities will do well over time. And you just have to avoid getting, you know, getting excited when other people are excited or getting, getting excited about certain industries when other people are. Trying to behave like a professional when you, you aren't spending the time and, 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 and bringing what's needed to the game to be a professional. And if you're an amateur investor, there's nothing wrong with being an amateur investor. And you just simply, you've got a very logical, profitable course of action available to you, and that is simply to buy into American business in a broadly diversified way and put your money in over time. So I would say your, your group of 20 will probably, will, will probably match an index fund, and, and you'll probably do well in that, and, and you will do well in an index fund. Charlie? Well, I, I've got nothing to add, but I do think it's that knowing the edge of your own competency is very important. If you think you know a lot more than you do, well, you're really asking for a lot of trouble. I am very interested in your policies on diversification and also how you concentrate your investments. And I've studied your annual reports going back a good number of years, and there's been years where you had a lot of stocks in your marketable, equitable securities portfolio, and there was one year where you only had three in 1987. Uh, whenever you, it seems that whenever you take a new investment, you never take less than about 5% and never more than about 10% of the total portfolio with that new position. And I wanted to see if I'm correct about that. We like to put a lot of money in things that, uh, that we feel strongly about. And that gets back to the diversification question. Uh, you know, we, we think diversification is, as practice generally, makes very little sense for anyone that knows what they're doing. Uh, they, diversification is a protection against ignorance. I mean, if you want to make sure that nothing bad happens to you relative to the market, you own everything. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that, that is a perfectly sound approach for somebody who, who does not feel they know how to analyze businesses. If you know how to analyze businesses and value businesses, it's crazy to own 50 stocks or 40 stocks or 30 stocks probably, uh, because there aren't that many wonderful businesses at, that are understandable to a single human being in all likelihood. And it, and to have some super wonderful business and then put money in number 30 or 35 on your list of attractiveness and, and forego putting more money into number one just strikes Charlie and me as, as, as madness. And it, it, it's conventional practice and it, it, it may, uh, you know, if all you have to achieve is, is average, uh, it it's, uh, it it's, uh, may preserve your job, but it's, it's a confession in our view that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Um, you know, I base, I mean, as on a personal portfolio basis, you know, I own one stock. 
you know, it, but it's a business I know, it, and, and it leaves me very comfortable. Uh, so, you know, do I, do I need to own 28 stocks in order to you know, have proper diversification, you know? Uh, be nonsense. And within Berkshire, I could pick out three of our businesses, and I would, I would be very happy if they were the only businesses we owned and I had all my money in Berkshire. Now, I love it, the fact that we can find more than that and that we keep adding to it. But three wonderful businesses is, 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 more than, uh, is more than you need in this life to do very well. And uh, uh, the, average, the average person isn't going to run into that. I mean, if you look at how the fortunes were built in this country, uh, they weren't built out of a portfolio of 50 companies. They were, they were built by someone who, who uh, identified with a, with a wonderful business. Coca-Cola is a great example. A lot of fortunes have been built on that. And, there aren't 50 Coca-Colas. You know, there aren't 20. If there were, it'd be fine. We could all go out and diversify like crazy among that group and, and get results that would be equal to owning the really wonderful one. But you're not going to find it. And, uh, and the truth is you don't need it. I mean, if you, if you have a really wonderful business is very well protected against, against the vicissitudes of the economy over time and, and, and the competition. I mean, you know, we're talking about businesses that are resistant to effective competition. And three of those will be better than 100 average businesses. At, uh, uh, and, and they'll be safer, incidentally. I mean, uh, they, there is less risk in owning three easy to identify wonderful businesses there, than there is in owning 50 uh, well-known big businesses. And uh, uh, it's amazing what has been taught over the years in finance classes about that. but. Uh, uh, I can assure you that that uh, I would rather pick if if I had to bet the next 30 years on the fortunes of uh, of my family that would be dependent upon the income from a given group of businesses. I would rather pick three businesses from those we own than own a diversified group of 50. Charlie, mm -hmm. yeah, what he's saying is that much of what is taught in modern corporate finance courses is twaddle. Do you want to elaborate on that, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot believe this stuff. I huh? mean, it, it's uh, modern portfolio theory, and uh, yeah, it's it's. It has no utility. But I mean, it, 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 you know, it will tell you how to do average, but you know, I, I, I think uh, anybody can figure out how to do average in fifth grade. I mean, it, it's just not that difficult. And uh, it's, it's elaborate, and you know, there's lots of little Greek letters and all kinds of things to make you feel that you're in the big leagues, but it, uh, there is no value added. <laughs> I have great difficulty with it because I am something of a student of dementia, and I have... <laughs> Yeah, we hang around a lot together. And I can ordinarily <laughs> classify dementia, you know, on some uh, theory structure of models, but the modern portfolio theory, uh, it involves a type of dementia I just can't even classify. No. Something very strange is going on. <laughs> yeah. if, you find, if you find three wonderful businesses in your life, you'll get very rich. And, and if you understand them, Bad things aren't going to happen to that, those three. I mean, that, that's the characteristic of it. it uh, By the way, maybe that's the reason there's so much dementia. If you believe what Warren said, you could teach the whole course in about a week. Yeah. <laughs> mm. To the extent that you would diversify your holdings beyond Berkshire Hathaway, given this environment, how would you choose the investment managers? The idea that very smart people with investment skills should have hugely diversified portfolios is madness. It's a very conventional madness, and it's taught in all the business schools, but they're wrong. You, you will occasionally see something that, that you should load up on, and, and uh, as Charlie says, that's what you really have to do. I mean, some of the people in this room uh, loaded up on Berkshire many years ago. <clears throat> And the truth was, they didn't need diversification. You know, I, I loaded up on it. That uh, Char Charlie did, and uh, you, you'll see opportunities 
occasionally, but you, you're not going to see them every day or every week. If you, if you think you're going to see an opportunity every week, you're going to lose a lot of money. I have a question regarding global diversification just in general. What do you look for in a company? The question is about, about global diversification. All we want to be in is businesses that we understand, run by people that we like, and it priced attractively compared to the future prospects. So there is no specific desire to either be in the rest of Europe or the rest of the world or the Far East or uh, to avoid it. It, it, it. It's simply a factor that, that uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a big factor. There may be more chances for growth in some countries. Uh, we, 80 percent of Coca-Cola's earnings, uh, roughly, will come from outside the United States. Uh, Eighty percent of Guinness's earnings will come from outside the United States, but they're domiciled outside the United States, whereas Coca-Cola is domiciled here. Certainly, in many cases, uh, there are markets outside the United States that have way better prospects for growth than, uh, than the U.S. market would have, but they probably have some other risks to them that, that, that this market may not have. Uh, but we, you know, we, we like the international prospects, obviously, of a company like Coke. We like the international prospects of a company like Gillette. Gillette earns 70 percent of its money outside this country. So if you look on a look-through basis, Coke, uh, we might this year get something like $150 million of earnings uh, indirectly for Berkshire's interest from the rest of the world just through Coca-Cola alone. Uh, but we don't make any specific, we don't think in terms of, I like this region so I want to be there or something of the sort. It, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's specific to the companies we were looking at and then we'll try to evaluate that. Uh, Coke is expanding in China. Well, it, uh, you know, that, I think, I forget what they showed last year, maybe 38 percent growth or something like that in cases. Uh, maybe uh, it's, uh, it's nice to have markets like that that, that are re relatively untapped. You don't have to be right on 20 percent of the companies in the world or 10 percent of the companies in the world or 5 percent. You only have to get one good idea every year or two. You can f come up with a very profitable uh, decision on a single company. Uh, I would hate to be measured if somebody t gave me all 500 stocks in the S&P, and I had to make some prediction about how they would behave uh, relative to the market over the next couple of years. I don't, I don't know how I would do, but maybe I can find one in there where I think I'm 9 in 10, 90 percent in, in being right. It, uh, it's an enormous advantage in stocks. It's a, you only have to be right on a very, very few things in your lifetime as long as you never make any big mistakes. What's, and, what's interesting is that at least 90 percent of the professional investment management operations don't think the way we do at all. They just think if they hire enough people, they can be better at determining whether Pfizer or Merck is going to do better over the next 20 years. And they can do that stock by stock all through the 500 and uh, have wide diversification. And at the end of 10 years, they'll be way ahead of other people. And of course, they won't. Very few people have this idea of searching for just a few opportunities. Yeah, you wait for the fat pitch. Ted Williams wrote about that in a book called The Science of Hitting. He said the most important thing in being a, a good hitter, you know, is to is to wait for the pitch in in, in the sweet spot, basically. But, uh, you know, I've always said that the, the way to get a reputation for being a good businessman is to buy a good business. You know, <laughs> it's much easier than taking a lousy business, you know, and, and, and showing how wonderful you are at it, because I haven't seen that done very often. Do you think an, an individual or a business owner here in the U.S. should diversify his or her investments uh, in non-dollar based securities? If you have a good business in this country earning money in dollars, you'll do okay. I mean, you may, you may live in a world 20 years from now where a couple percent of the GDP is going to service the debts and the ownership that we've created now by, by running these deficits, but you, you'll do fine in America, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that much. Charlie? Well, if you look at Berkshire, you will find that it 
really doesn't do much of conventional asset allocation to categories. We are looking for opportunities, and we don't much care what category they're in. And we certainly don't want to have our search for opportunities governed by some predetermined artificial bunch of categories. In this sense, we're totally out of step with modern investment management, but we think they're wrong. Yeah. And incidentally, we, we, we have 80 percent of our money or more, well over 80 percent, tied to, tied to this country and to the dollar. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's not like, you know, we've left the country or anything of the sort. But when have you done a big asset allocation strategy? Never. Yeah. Yeah. We end up with peculiar asset mixes. I mean, if, if, yeah. if the junk bond thing had gone on a little longer, instead of having $7 billion in there, we might have had $30 billion in. But we were doing that simply based on the fact that it was screaming at us. And we do the same thing with equities. I mean, back for many years, we had more than the net worth of, of Berkshire in, in equity positions. And, but they were cheap. And I want you to remember one of my favorite sayings as you do this asset allocation. If a thing's not worth it, doing at all, it's not worth doing well. Basically, the Munger family is in two or three things only. Well, uh, diversification is my idea of not something I have practically no interest in, except as it happens automatically in a big place like Berkshire. Uh, I rejoiced the day I got rid of a quote, you know, a stock quoting machine. Yeah. And uh, I like this buy and hold investing. It's a lovely way to live a life and you deal with a better class of people. And, and it's worked pretty well for all of us. Oh, I don't own any indexes. And I have always been willing to be, own just two or three stocks. And I have not minded that everybody who teaches finance in uh, law school and business school teaches that what I'm doing is wrong. It isn't wrong. It's worked beautifully. Uh, I don't think you need a portfolio of 50 stocks if you know what you're doing. And I hope my heirs will just sit. My heirs hope that I'll change my will. <laughs> <laughs> he is not comfortable with positions becoming a large part of his portfolio. For example, when they reach 25 to 35 percent, he mentioned that Apple is now 35 percent of Berkshire's portfolio and thinks that that is near a danger zone. Wonders if Warren and Charlie can comment. Well, I'd like to make one comment first, but Charlie will come up with. I think he's out of his mind. Yeah, I knew that, that was coming. <laughs> But Apple is not 35% of, of Berkshire's portfolio. Berkshire's portfolio includes the railroad, the energy business, your animals, you name it, seized candy. They're all businesses. One of the inane things that's taught in modern university education is that a vast diversification is absolutely mandatory in investing in common stocks. That is an insane idea. It's not that easy to have a vast plethora of good opportunities that are easily identified. And if you've only got three, I'd rather be in my best ideas instead of my worst. And now, some people can't tell their best ideas from their worst. And in the act of deciding that an investment already is good, they, they get to thinking it's better than it is. I think we make fewer mistakes like that than other people, and that is a blessing to us. But if you know the edge of your own ability pretty well, you should ignore most of the notions of our experts about what I call diversification of portfolios. What do you see as the arguments for longtime shareholders to continue holding their stock versus diversifying their risk across an index? I personally prefer holding Berkshire to holding the market. I, I think our businesses are better than the average in the market. I, I recommend the S&P 500 index fund and uh, that for uh, a long, long time to people. And uh, I've never recommended Berkshire to anybody uh, because I, I don't want people to buy it because they think I'm <laughs> tipping them into some side. Never. I mean, no matter what it was selling for. And uh, 
uh, and you know, I, I, I made it public. I, you know, on on my death, there's a there's a fund for my uh, then, then widow, and 90% uh, will go into an S and P 500 index fund and 10% of Treasury bills. And, uh, on the other hand, I'm very happy having my future contributions to a group of charities that will be spread over 12 years or so after my death uh, to stay in Berkshire. A person who doesn't know anything about stocks uh, at all and doesn't have any special feelings about Berkshire, I think they ought to, they ought to buy the S&P 500 index.